Hello friends and welcome. This video will be an introduction to a mini series uh, of videos, probably three or four videos about my main amp that I use. So um, this video will be the introduction and sort of what this amp is for, uh, what it's designed for, what are, uh, are some of its uh, design principles and goals, um, some of its limitations and um, yeah, and, 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 and the, sound the sound quality of it. Now, after that, we go to series um, video number two. And in video number two, I will um, show you the schematic of the amplification part. So we'll, we'll talk about that and the, the components used. And then in part three, we'll look at the voltage regulation. So the power design, the, the power um, uh, part of this amp. So the, the power supply section. And then there might be a fourth video where we tie things up and uh, maybe answer any questions that you may have um, that are posted in the comments um, and maybe not. We'll see how we go with, with, uh, with video four. Anyway, let's get into the introduction. So what is this amp for? Well, this amp was a continuation of an older experiment um, for a very difficult to drive headphone, uh, which is the Hi Feynman HE6. And, um, and, and it's an older model, I've got this four screw model and it's notoriously hard to drive. So I was driving them with these four P1L tubes and I, what I was discovering is that these, uh, not in push-pull but in deferential, um, actually sounded very good um, to very much, not like a push-pull amplifier like you would expect, and what, but it sounded, and also not quite single-ended. But it, it, I found that the imaging, uh, the 3D imaging was 90% of what a single-ended amp can do. And so I was very happy with that. And I was also very happy with its dynamic performance. Um, and it's especially um, very well suited to this type of um, pass tube regulated um, power supply. So that was one of the principles to start out with um, that I wanted to build further on. And the other thing was these are all directly heated tubes. So another facet of this whole amp is that it is completely directly heated. Now these are not triodes. These are pentodes wired up in, in, in triode mode. Um, the other thing, the, the third facet of this amp is um, it uses no capacitors in the signal path. Um, not even a bypass capacitor. So they've been completely avoided. Um, so that, you know, sometimes you have to solve things by getting really quality items. In this case, they're just solved by not needing them. Um, you know, that's one part of that. And here I solved it differently. So here a filament, a filament bias has been used. And here, of course, we are using a common, um, a, a common uh, cathode resistor. Um, however, this is not a resistor. It's a, um, a um, rectifier tube uh, and I'm using only one arm of it of the full rectifier um, and that creates the bias for the output stage. So that's another thing I've, I've tried to minimize even the use of resistors in the signal path. Um, I'm a big fan of wire wound transistors, uh, over dimensioned wire wound uh, resistors and um, yes so minimal components really and so what also has been done of course if i am using an interstage transformer to do the phase splitting so after we have this single ended stage we get an interstage transformer then we got a differential output stage and then of course a differential um so a, a push pull transformer but the trans push pull transformer is is geared towards class a so it can only deal with a five milliamp um, difference between um, the, the quiescent current between the tubes and um, yeah so that's the um, output stage and that means that you get an extremely high inductance on your output transformer and so if you then look at the whole design we've got a, a driver tube with a relatively uh, low um, plate resistance so in this case it's 2900 ohms and it just means that these things combined have a very high bandwidth so both use Landals. Um, I think both of that is, is also a limitation on the whole amp. So the, the amp itself, I think is much higher quality than I'm, I'm getting at the output. Now the quality in at the output is very high. I'll get into that in a second, but um, 
Yes, bandwidth wise, um, there is hardly any roll off. Like we're talking maybe mi minus one dB at seven hertz or something. It's it's very low. I haven't, I should measure it again, but it's low. So, um, so that's it. Minimum of components, um, transformer coupling. Uh, all the stages are being fed with, with um, inductors. Regulated voltage to have uh, constant working points and I'm using a shunt input uh, volume control. Now, let's talk about the sound. So the sound is very good. So this is the first amp where I can hear recording techniques, how the vinyl was recorded. I can hear all kinds of things. Um, it's very easy to hear the difference between decks. Uh, deck versus the CD player uh, and, and so on. It is crystal clear. So this amp has a lot of... Um, it's very revealing. It, it's hardly colored. It, it are, there is, these are... And especially in this combination by using different tubes. Um, if you use too many of these you get a bit of a... Of a um, a harshness in the highs you can get get with, with using, um, for example, this I tried it before as a driver tube, the 4P1L as driver and as, as output tube, but that didn't work well. But this tube, the 2P29L, driving this is just really extremely neutral. So I find it a bit funny that a lot of people also, oh yeah, tubes add a nice thing to the sound. Well, I find that this amps add minimal coloration to um, to the sound, so there's nothing obvious going. It's extremely neutral, but not mechanical. It's it's and as I said, it's very revealing of of the source that you use. I can easily hear some influence of transistors in there. You can hear microphone this just about everything. Now that's it. I said. I've recently uh, did some experience with Amorphous Core and I can say that one of the limitations is here is the iron use. So this is very high quality how, uh, compared to a lot what you'll get. However, this design has much more potential. So this, the, the circuitry is very good, I think. And there's one condition which I'll have to mention. The, I'll, I'll get into that in seconds, which is on the limitations of this amp. But um, yeah, I, I really like the circuitry and it can be, I think, still massively improved by using better interstage and a better output transformer. And that would lift it to a whole new class of amplifier. I, I, that's my expectation here. Now, what are the limitations of this amp? The limitation is low gain. We're talking about the these, of course, um, well, there, there are two of them. So this would be a gain normally of about seven or eight. Um, and this is the same thing. So we're only talking about, you know, 49 to 64 times gain in here. Um, and that puts some requirements on the input signal. So you want the input signal to be reasonably high, sort of one and a half volt is ideal the way it's set up currently. Um, if you bias these slightly higher, with a higher bias voltage, um, you can actually deal with our larger signals. Um, one of the advantages though of, of this low gain is that you'll always have your volume knob very high. So if you use a shunt, uh, shunt based uh, volume control, this is 24 steps. So you have 24 resistor pairs that divide the voltage. Um, you'll always end up with the, with the signal going through a very small, relatively small um, resistor. So the losses are, are quite minimal. And I think that's one of the things that people overlook in amp, in, in amp choice and amp design. If you always have your volume control over the minimum, it means you're throwing away most of the signal. Um, not so in this case, but it's also a limitation. So if your phone stage um, is, is, is uh, or maybe even the LP has a very low volume. So for example, this LP is, uh, is uh, about a half hour on, on one side. So the volume with which it is recorded is, is quite low. So if you then combine it with not enough gain, um, you might struggle to get enough volume out of this amp. Um, now that can, you know, that can be solved in various ways or have more gain in your phone stage or use a step up transformer somewhere. Um, however, what it did allow me is just to keep this very simple and make use of, of course, of the tubes that I had in stock. 
um, and use these directly heated pentodes wired up in triode and not have to go to um, anything a resort to tricks to uh, increase the gain or even add another stage so those are the limitations sound quality uh, choices I think that, that this is uh, the, the headline overview of this amp. So in the next video, I will go into the schematics. Um, so you get a sort of more in-depth detailed look uh, into it. And, um, and then of course in part three, we'll go into the power regulation, um, which is uh, not that common, um, but I think it works well for this type of amp, the way it is set up here. Uh, it won't work for all situations. For example, pure single ended the designs. Um, with quite some power delivery, I would not really advise against this structure. But in this amp, I think it, it, it works well and creates a very um, stable environment. Um, and, and I think it excludes a lot of line quality issues as well. So that's it for this video. Thank you for listening. I uh, hope you found this um, interesting, especially for those of you who are self-builders or, uh, or even designers. Um, so this is, um, yeah, you know, this is one of the things that, that has some influences in probably Sakuma and, and uh, Steve Bench, um, maybe even Thomas Meyer. Um, so th th those are the amp designers that, that I, I highly regard and, and, and take ideas and concepts for, but the, the mix is all my own and the, the choice of tubes. Um, the result of a lot of experimenting. And so, um, yeah, it's a bit different probably from what you see published all the time. Anyway, that's it for now. Um, thank you. And um, I hope to catch you in the next video. Until then, take care. Have a brilliant day. Bye bye.